So I love the local church, and more importantly, I love the Bible. And uh, so we're going to open up the scriptures together and uh, let God speak to us. So Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1. And let's look at verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and in patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. I was on the island of Patmos. Everybody say Patmos. It's just an important uh, part of what we're going to talk about. Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. Everybody say, I was in the spirit. Those five words are very important. I was in the spirit. He's on Patmos but he was in the spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. He's getting a vision of Jesus, dressed in robe, a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. Hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a blazing fire, his feet like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in its brilliance. This is the end of of John's life, and I want us to back up in the story just a little bit and begin uh, with the beginning of John's life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be here, and we're just asking that you speak to us through your word. We're asking that you speak to us over these next few moments at all of our campuses. Father, we're asking that you do what only you can do. Move me aside. Thank you that I'm a forgettable voice, but Father, may we hear you the voice within my voice, in Jesus' name, speak to every situation. There are hurting people here today. There are broken people. There are confused people. There are people that are facing great frustrations in life. But we thank you, Father, that we can find direction through your word in moments like this. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. I want to use this idea to talk to you about how to think right in stressful places how to think right in disappointing places, how to think right in broken places, how to think right when your dreams are shattered, how to think right when you were believing God to heal a marriage and it still fell apart, how you did everything you could but there was still betrayal with someone that you loved, how you felt like you did what you could and your children still went the wrong direction. So many different times we find ourselves in stressful places but I do believe there's a way to think about those things. John is the one that's writing the book of Revelation. And John is known as one of the sons of thunder. One of the first ways we're introduced to John is his mom comes to Jesus and says, I want to know which one of my sons is going to sit on the right and which one's going to sit on the left. So John comes from an ambitious family, a driven family, a goal-oriented family. He comes from a family that wants great things in life. We see John, not much later than that, going into a village that rejects Jesus and the rest of the disciples. And John and his brother James' response is, let's call down fire on that city. Let's burn that town to the ground. So this beautiful man that we read about, John the Beloved, didn't begin that way. He was a man with a hot temperament, he was a man that could be easily angered. He was a man that would go nuclear in a heartbeat. John, as we know, is one of the 12 apostles. But beyond that, we would also begin to see that he's one of the favored three within the 12, along with James and Simon Peter. He would be one of the apostles that would be invited on the Mount Transfiguration, just one of a few that would be invited there to see Jesus Transfigured. Of course, there, Moses and Elijah would show up and discuss the things Jesus would accomplish through his death. Isn't that interesting? That you accomplish things not only in life, but if you live life right, you even accomplish things through your death. They were there to discuss that. John was present for that. John was present 
when they went into the room of Jairus and his daughter was lifeless there. The other apostles were asked to wait outside in the hallway, but there John, James, and Simon Peter see Jesus raise that young girl back to life. When you got to the Garden of Gethsemane, all the disciples were asked to stop in one place, but then Peter, James, and John went a little bit further. So John is a favored apostle among all the apostles. Simon Peter would even see that in the middle of the three that John had somewhat of a special relationship with Jesus. The one who would walk on water would even see something distinct about John. And we primarily see this change or this moment happen at the Last Supper. You show up there and all the disciples are disputing at the Last Supper still, who's the greatest? Who's the best? Who's, who's going to, what, what's, they're, they're ranking themselves, they're comparing themselves. But the Bible says John is not in the conversation. He finds a seat as close to Jesus as he possibly could. But yet we find that that's still not enough for John. So then you see him begin to recline onto the body of Jesus. Yet he's still not close enough. And then he does something unusual. A grown man takes his head and he places it on the chest of another grown man. He's not involved in the debate concerning who's the best or the greatest. He's not striving. He's not competing. He's not calling down fire. John has his head in a very specific place, a place where he would learn to hear something others could not. And it's clearly the turning point in the life of John. This is the moment I see that John separates from the other disciples. After this, others would turn their back on Jesus at the critical hour, but John would remain. John would learn how to get his mind right, how to get his thinking right, even in the midst of stressful and dangerous places. He learned to lay his head where no one else would. He might have looked funny. It might have looked goofy. It might have looked like something that was strange or unusual, but John didn't care what people thought. He didn't care how it looked. He didn't care what other people saw in that moment. All he wanted to do was be as close to Jesus as he could possibly get. He wanted to be as close to the heart of God as he possibly could. And I wonder today, when God looks across this auditorium, we're all here eating at the Lord's table. We all have different things that we're working on, thinking about. But I wonder if God sees us like John today. I wonder if God sees a group of people that are here saying, I don't know what's gonna happen in church today, but I don't wanna leave this room until I hear the heartbeat of your son. That's what we find special about John. He wasn't satisfied with just teaching of Je the teachings of Jesus. He wasn't satisfied with even being in the inner circle where the teachings would be broke down or the parables would be broke down and explained. He wasn't content with the meals or even the miracles. John had to be as close to Jesus' heart as he could possibly get. When you show up to church and we worship, that's the point of worship. It's not songs that you're singing. It's not slow songs. It's not a filler to wait to get to something else. We're not passing the time. Worship is God's gift to us, and it's how we draw close to him. And as we draw close to him, he draws close to us. It's how we decide to recline and rest in a chaotic, stressful world and maybe for just a moment take our head and get it as close to his heart as we possibly can. That's why we open up the scriptures. That's why we break down the word together because it's us taking our head and putting it as close to his heart as we possibly can. Maybe somehow in whatever I'm facing, I can have the heart of God in my life and about my situation. That's why you serve. That's why you give. That's why you do the different things. You can give God a good hand clap if you want. I'm okay. We're talking about his heart. There's absolutely something that God when, when, when you're after his heart, everything begins to get clear. I think about serving in church, and it's so easy to think, oh, that's for them, or that's for so-and-so, or that's for so-and-so. But if you're too big to do small, small things, you're too small to do big things. And what we learn through serving is that Jesus came, the Bible says, not seeking the crown, but the symbol of his ministry was the towel. And when you serve, what are you doing? You're leaning in to his heart. You're leaning into the way that God thinks about things. I heard a story many years ago about a woman whose son had uh, 
been in a tragic accident and they wanted to know if she wanted to give her son's heart to someone that needed a heart transplant. She has to make the difficult decision to do that. Well, normal protocol when this happens is that you have to wait a year after the transplant occurs and the recipient, if they want to, will then contact the family uh, of the donor. Well, this mom wasn't going to do that. She somehow found out, uh, no one knows exactly how, where the son's heart was going as it was being transported. She follows where it was going. She waits for the surgery to happen. She gets through all the different layers of people and checks, uh, checkpoints that are there, and she finds her way into the room where this person had just received the transplant, and she has her head laying on this person's chest. When they come in the room, they tell her, what are you doing? Who are you? Why are you here? And and she begins to explain that it was her son's heart in the, that person's chest. And they tell the mom, you can't do that. You can't be here. This is, this is wrong. We don't know how you got here, but you've got to get out of here. And she would not leave her head from being on the chest of that individual. And she said, I'm not leaving. I just need to hear the heartbeat of my son. And when you come to church, there has to be something in you where you say above all things, above everything else going on, above all the other chaos in our world, above all the other stress going on, so much you could pay attention to, but you have to have something on the inside of you that says, I just wanna hear the heartbeat of God's son. I have to get my head right in an evil time. I'm not at the Lord's table today because I wanna be special. I'm not at the Lord's table today because I'm trying to be something great or I'm trying to be right about this or that. I've just learned I don't want to be at the wrong end of the table. I want to be as close to his heart as I could possibly get. I, I don't, you don't know me very well, but I can promise you this. I can sling mud with the best of them. I can get angry about things with the best of them. I can call down fire with anybody. I can get in a debate about this endless dispute or that one with the best of them. I probably should have been an attorney instead of a pastor. I, I absolutely love it. I love a good fight. It just is in who I am. It's the way I was raised, I guess. But I've just learned at the end of the day, I don't wanna be at the wrong end of the table. I wanna get right up to where he is. And it's good for you to be here today because what can happen in moments like this is God can start edging you from this, the seat of competition, the seat of comparison, the seat over here of, of, of ven, revenge, the seat over here of unforgiveness. And he can start just moving you. And you can say, do I wanna leave here the same way with a hardened heart? With, do I wanna leave here today with all kinds of stress and, and perspective? on this or that, or do I want to leave here today knowing I've heard the heartbeat of God's son? I've learned I can't think right if I don't hear the heartbeat. I've learned I can't have peace if I don't hear the heartbeat. I can't have joy if I don't hear his heartbeat. I can't have strength if I do not hear his heartbeat. And what John teaches us is if we'll get our head to where his heart is, we can get our head right, our thinking right in stressful times. Over the years, I've learned that the devil, if he can get my attention on anything else but this, he can distract me, he can detour me, maybe he can even defeat me, but if I'll just make a decision, no matter how I feel, no matter what's going on in life, to find the heart of God in the matter, the devil can never touch someone that has their attention focused on drawing close to his heart. You see, Simon Peter saw John in the way that I'm talking about the one who had walked on water. His accomplishments and his exploits were amazing. But yet you see Simon Peter at the Last Supper, hearing Jesus say these words, one of you will betray me. All the disciples are saying, I wonder which one it is. Is it going to be this one? Is it going to be that one? Is it going to be the one over here? Or is it gonna be the one over here? Well, Simon Peter wants to know. He doesn't ask Jesus. Instead, he asked John. He knew John had a special relationship with Jesus. So Simon Peter says, John, would you ask Jesus who it is? And so John leans over and says, Jesus, who is it? And Jesus said, of course, John, I'll tell you anything you want to know because I see where your head is. I see that your thinking is close to my heart and I'll reveal to you anything you wanna know. And so he tells John, it's the one whose hand is in the sock. And it teaches us that, when we're at the table, if we'll get close to his heart and there's something we don't know, we're confused about something, there's a direction we can't figure out, there's a question we need an answer to, we're trying to figure out how to make a decision in an area of our life, 
God has a way of telling those who are close to him. The Bible says the secret of the Lord is revealed to those who fear him. In other words, if you'll get close to his heart, God will tell you everything you need to know. If there's something you need to know to accomplish his will for your life, if you'll get close to his heart, God's not going to say, say stay silent. God's not going to pull back and not talk to you. If you'll get close to his heart, God has a way of being faithful to talk to you and I about the things that we need to know. Now, think about this. I ask you to mention the word Patmos when we read that, to say the word Patmos out loud. At the writing of this text that we read, it's approximately 95 AD. John is 93 years old at the time of this writing. He had walked with Jesus in the flesh for three years. He had been faithful to God's call in his life as an apostle and bishop for over 60 years. He's old, his bones are aching, he's gray-headed, he's been used of God in a mighty way. He's a special apostle. The emperor Domitian in 95 AD decides to have John arrested and taken to Rome. His execution sentence was pronounced and history teaches us that he would be thrown in a pot of hot and boiling oil. Somehow the hand of God was on him and he survives the moment that he's thrown in the oil. The emperor Domitian hears about it and he writes a decree saying that John is to be exiled to the island of Patmos. Patmos is not the kind of island we would think about when we hear island. It's not a Caribbean island. Patmos is right off the coast of Turkey and it's 10 miles long, 6 miles wide and it's almost solid rock. It's treeless, it's a hard place, it's a hot place, it's a difficult place and it's a place that they would send the most vile criminals of that day. The worst of the worst would go to Patmos. Patmos, when you got there, is a life sentence. When you get there, you don't get off of this island. So he's 93 years old, he's hurting, he's aged, and he's banished to this island, surrounded by thieves and murderers and rapists, all the worst of the worst or the lowest of the low. He should have been in comfortable retirement at this point. He should have been pastor emeritus. He should have been the one with the nice office and his feet kicked up. He had paid his dues. He had paid the price. He deserved that. He deserved for someone else to handle the difficult things and someone else to hear everybody else's problems, but yet that's not where he was. He's instead in this place that we talked about called Patmos. And it would have been easy for John to say, I don't deserve this. I've loved you. I've served you. I'm the one among everybody else that had my head on your chest. I'm the one above everybody else. You said, take care of your mom, my, my mom when you were hanging on the cross, and I did that. I was there when others split. I was by your side no matter what. And now here I am at the end of my life having served you with everything I have on this island, dying like this, not surrounded by saints that I love, but surrounding by people that can't stand me and hate me. I don't deserve this. John had no idea why his life would end in this particular way, but he also had no idea that he was about to write the closing book of God's holy word. He had no idea that God was gonna open up the windows to the future. He had no idea that he was about to see into the ages to come, that he would see things like the Antichrist, that he would see about things like the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He didn't know any of that. All he knew is he's there suffering, he's there lonely on a forsaken island, but he had learned something 60 years earlier. He had learned there at that table how to get his thinking right in stressful places. He had learned how to get his mind right in the dangerous places of life. He had learned how to find God's heart no matter what he's facing in life. And so John there on Patmos, this place surrounded by danger, this place with no possible future, old, his body from head to toe burned with third degree burns, there he is and somehow yet John decides, I'm gonna find the heart of God in all of this. Somehow I'm gonna find his heart. Somehow I'm gonna draw close to him. And then it says, that John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was on Patmos, but that didn't mean he couldn't get in the spirit. He was in the spirit in a place like Patmos, which teaches us you can get in the spirit no matter what you might be facing, no matter what situation you might be going through. If John can get in the spirit as difficult as Patmos was, you can learn to get in the spirit and find the heart of God no matter what you're facing. If John could somehow find a personal revival on a pl- in a place like Patmos, you can find a personal revival through whatever struggle you're going through. 
through today, but you've got to make a decision. I'm not going to look at the temporal. I'm not going to look at what everyone else is focused on. I'm not going to look at the natural. Instead, I'm going to get back in the spirit because that's the key. That's the key to the Christian life, right? You don't, you don't walk in the flesh. You walk by the spirit. Paul said, oh, you foolish Galatians. How is it that you expect to finish in the flesh what you began in the spirit? It's not by might, is what Zachariah says. It's not by power, but it is by his spirit, saith the Lord. There's something about learning that we are in a spiritual arena right now. You are not just natural people. You are not just brains in a jar. You have a spirit and you have to learn to be led by the spirit. It's what the Bible says. As many that are led by the spirit, or as many are the sons of God are led by the spirit of God. The word led is the word lasso. It's a ranching term. That's how that God does it. He lassos you. You might be running. You might be resisting. You might be heading in a wrong direction today. But if you'll let God lasso you, he'll just start pulling you back to, towards what? He'll start pulling you back towards his heart. It's how you get your mind right in your Patmos. It's how you get your thinking right in the stressful places. So John got in the spirit. He had no idea that he was about to see something that's probably one of the most important revelations that mankind's ever heard or known, especially in the day that we live in. But God knew what he was about to show John. God knew he could trust John. God knew where John had placed his head. God knew that he had taken care of his mother. God knew that he had walked up the mountain with them, that he'd walked in the room when Jairus' daughter was raised back to life. God knew he could trust John. And God knew that he needed someone like John to write this book for him. And he knew to do it, he would have to find someone that could get in the spirit. And so John got in the spirit and he heard a great voice behind him. It's one of the most important things. I can't hear God. I can't sense his voice. I, I don't know what he's trying to say to me. I, I, I'm trying to find out what's the will of God in this area of my life. If you'll get in the spirit, the first thing that begins to happen is all of a sudden that, little, that whisper of God, you begin to hear it. Spurgeon called it the screaming voice or the screaming whisper of the Holy Spirit. It's a whisper, but yet it's so clear and so loud. When you get in the spirit, you begin to hear God talk to you. You hear things other people can't. And then it says he turned and saw. Not only do you hear what others can't, you begin to see what others can't. You begin to see things that others just can't. Why? Because they're over here in the flesh. They're over here in the natural. They're over here looking at the circumstance, over here looking at the situation, over here consumed with their patmos and how unfair it is and how this shouldn't be happening and how, how it should be different than what it is. But if you'll get in the spirit, you'll hear things others cannot hear and you'll see things others cannot see. So the emperor Domitian, the one who had put him on this island, John has no idea, has kicked the bucket. It's 97 AD, a new emperor, the emperor Nerva, takes the throne, and he wants to know where the old apostle is, the apostle John, the only remaining living apostle. He finds out that John's on Patmos, and he wants to know what he's doing there. And so they give him the records and as he reads the records, he sees that there's really no valid reason for John to be in this place. And so he writes a new decree, which simply says, go get John. So they dispatch the ships from Rome, and they're on their way to Patmos to go get John. John's not focused on being re rescued. John's not focused on escaping Patmos. He's focused on finding out what is God wanting to show me here in this place? What is God trying to reveal to me in this stressful place? And so John gets carried away in the spirit and the Bible says he gets this vision that we read of Jesus. I'll read it one more time. The one that he hasn't seen for 60 years, the one that he loved, the one that you see his head is on his chest, he's hearing his heartbeat. It says this, someone like a son of man dressed in robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair of his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a blazing fire, his feet like bronze gl glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand was held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. Jesus immediately takes John and says, hey, I want to show you some things. I want to show you this city whose builder and maker is God. And John sees the new Jerusalem. He sees heaven. 
It's a thousand miles wide, a thousand miles long, and a thousand miles high. He sees the gate to that city that's carved out of one pearl, three stories high. If you think the pearl is impressive, imagine how big the oyster was that made it. He sees the streets that aren't paved with gold, they're made out of it. He sees Jesus is the light of the city. The city doesn't need the sun, S-U-N, because Jesus is the light of the city. He sees the angels, the seraphims, the cherubims, the elders, all surrounding the throne of God, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. John begins to get a beautiful picture of heaven. He begins to see all of these things. He forgets about his body being burned. He forgets about Patmos. He forgets about being surrounded by criminals. He forgets about his death sentence. He got in the spirit and he starts writing what God was showing him. He starts writing the things that God was revealing to him in that place. And the whole time the ships are coming to get him out of that place. Once he's done writing, he looks up and the ships are over there on the horizon coming to get him. And I wanna take just a moment in closing and just say this. That if you'll get in the spirit about that situation that's stressful, if you'll get in the spirit, if you'll find God's heart, if you'll make a decision to say, I really haven't drawn close to him in all of this. I've got my opinions. I, I've, been, I've got my ways about things. I, 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 this is how I've done it. This is how I think of it. This is my personality. This is my nature. Uh, this is what everybody else would do. This is how everybody else would think. If you'll move all that back for just a moment, and you'll get in the spirit, God will do something in your life on Patmos that he'll do no other place. No matter how stressful or difficult it is, God will do something in your life. That's why when John's done writing, he looks up. So when God's done showing you what he needs to show you, then you look up. You don't look down, you don't look around, you look up. Get in the spirit on the Lord's day. I wonder today, the Bible talks about King David and it says that he was a man after God's own heart. It didn't say that God had his heart, it said he was a man after God's heart and there's a big difference. God can get your heart in a moment, right? That's what salvation is. That's when you come to Christ, you get his heart. You, he's merciful, he's loving, he's, but many times it takes a lifetime for you to find his heart. How can I trust him? How can I know what his will is? How can I know that he's faithful? How can I know that he'll come through every single time? And my prayer today at all of our locations is that you'll get in the spirit on the Lord's day, that you'll get out of the flesh, that you'll get out of the natural, that you'll make a decision to quit hanging out on the wrong side of the table and you'll draw close to his heart and hear the heartbeat of his son. Our location pastors are going to come, but here at this location, I'm gonna ask that you bow your head and close your eyes. And I'm gonna ask that you do something that is what we see John doing. I'm gonna ask for just a moment that you relax. There's no stress, there's no pressure. I'm gonna ask that you take a moment and recline. I'm gonna ask you to take just a moment and ask yourself, is my head close to his heart? In most of you, God will immediately give you a situation. He'll begin to speak to you about a Patmos, about something unfair, about something challenging, about something that's broken your heart, about something you don't understand. But if you'll take just a moment You'll hear his heart for you today. His heart for you is good, not evil. His heart is he loves you. His heart is he's for you. And if he be for you, who can be against you? It's your advantage in life that you can draw close to his heart. And if you'll hear, hear his heartbeat concerning that spouse, if you'll hear his heartbeat concerning that child, if you'll, hear, if you'll hear his heartbeat concerning that area of struggle, that area where the relationships have broke down, that area of loss, if you'll hear his heartbeat, 
I believe he'll say to you today things that you'll get no other place. Not, you're not going to get it from a preacher today. My job's done. Now it's back in your hands. Do you want to know his heart? Jesus, today we lean in. May we hear that beautiful heartbeat, that passionate heartbeat, that heartbeat that says, I'm going to work all things together for your good. What the enemy meant for evil, I mean it for your good. Thank you that today you're healing homes. The beginning of healing a marriage has taken place. Father, you're healing friendships. You're healing families. Father, you're healing somebody's body. Because if we'll get our mind right, You haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. The closer we get to your heart, the more sound our minds get concerning whatever we're facing. In Jesus' name, praise God. Just take just a moment and just give that situation to him. Father, we give it to you. We put it in your hands. And we trust those nail-scarred, faithful hands. We trust those wounded hands. You can do with it way more than we can. We stop the striving. We stop the pushing. We stop the fighting. And we give it to you, Jesus.